I think it's quite hard to predict technology out very far. People look at learning curves as a way to predict the future trajectory of technology. These are historical statistical relationships between how much how much experience we have producing a good and the cost of producing the good. And they, they often exhibit a tight statistical correlation, but I'm always hesitant to use that to project into the future because there's no underlying reason that that relationship has to be the same over time. This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens, with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community-oriented. Our guest today is Matt Clancy, who is a research fellow at Open Philanthropy and a senior fellow at the Institute for Progress. He maintains New Things Under the Sun, a living literature review about innovation. Our conversation with Matt gravitates around the state of knowledge of technological innovation. We talk about inputs to innovation, models of innovation, the discipline of progress studies, and ways to measure technological progress. We also cover the relationship between policy and innovation. So glad to have you here. We will get started with what sparked your interest in studying innovation? Well, thanks for having me on, guys. My interest started a long winding road. When I was an undergraduate, I was not studying any of this stuff. I was studying physics and religious studies. And I realized very quickly that I didn't want to do either of those things for the rest of my life. Eventually, I discovered economics, which I didn't really know anything about, like my last year of undergraduate, and thought of it as this field that uh, it's really important. It affects humans' lives, but it also is quantitative and has to do with human beings, which was something I was interested in. I originally wanted to do economic development type stuff because this seems like a very impactful kind of way to do economics. But uh, I got sidetracked getting convinced that the thing that affects differences in living standards over the very long run is technology. And so starting to think about where does that come from? And I never really looked back once I started to get obsessed with that question of where does technology come from and, and what drives it forward? I'm curious what path you took after that. So you discovered in your last year that economics is something you might want to pursue. The University of Cambridge in England has this great program called the Diploma in Economics that is a one-year program for people who did not study economics but want to study economics in graduate school. And so it's like a compressed undergraduate education in one year. So I did that. Then I worked for a couple of years as like a forecaster, sort of an analyst. Then I did a master's at London School of Economics, came back to the States, did a PhD in economics, where I focused on the economics of innovation. And then my first job was at the Department of Agriculture in the U.S., where I worked on science policy stuff. And that's the concrete path. My path got unusual. So I worked at the Department of Agriculture. I was a research economist. And then I worked at Iowa State University, where I taught economics for a few years. But then I started this. Originally, it was like just a newsletter, but it evolved into this. I call it like a living literature review about the economics of innovation and science and all social science related to innovation. And that project went from being something I did on the side to something I started to get grant support to do and buy out some of my time. And yeah, that's my main claim to fame now. So we'll be talking a lot about innovation, technological innovation today. And there are a lot of concepts entangled or a part of that story. So maybe it'd be helpful to start off by defining briefly. The first one is science. How would you define science? Yeah. As you said, you could do a lot of different things, but for my purposes, I'm going to think of it as 
there's two different ways you can think of science. There's science as a body of knowledge about how the world works that seeks to explain the regularities that we observe and the causal pathways in the universe. And then there's also a different sense of the word science, which is the organized human activity to build that knowledge. So there's like science as an enterprise and then science as a body of knowledge. But hopefully by context, we can make clear which one is which. Yeah, that's helpful. I like that causal pathways. And then technology. When you say technology, so what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think of it as something really broadly, really broad. There's this economist, Brian Arthur, and I like his definition that it's an orchestration of natural processes or natural regularities for achievement of some human end or some human purpose. So we leverage the fact that steam expands, for example, under heat to drive a piston. That's a natural regularity. And we bundle that with a bunch of other sort of principles and regularities in nature to make an engine that can do work for us. But it, it can be really broad, like human purposes is just intentionally a little bit vague. Anything that we care about doing, we're going to count as a technology. Yeah. And I think that's helpful. Let's talk about innovation. How do you think about that? Another thing where there's lots of different senses of what people mean by the word innovation. So in some technical domains, they really focus on this distinction between invention and innovation. And I've never really focused on that very much in my work. I'm more used in, I think, what the colloquial sense is now, which is the creation of something new, something interesting. So it's not just new, like a, a splatter of paint on the side of a wall could be new in the sense that nobody's ever done it before, but it's not interesting. It's got to be new, interesting, and then repeatable. So it's not a one-off event. It's something that is a principle that we can then apply and do over, like a new kind of technology, a new blueprint for a way of doing things or so on. So that's how I think of innovation in this sort of most abstract sense. But there, there's also this other sense where it's about commercializing inventions versus inventing things. And those are definitely important separate activities. But I think most people think of innovation as just the creation of new technologies or things like that. And that's what I usually mean when I refer to it. Okay, so the core sort of dimensions are novelty and repeatability, essentially. You also said interesting, but it seems to me that those two would be the core. Parameter. Right, right. So a volcano erupting might be new and interesting, but it's not like a repeatable phenomenon that we can use that information somehow to do it again and again on, on different mountains, maybe. I don't know. That's, that's kind of how I've always thought of it. Like, uh, yeah. there's some inherent, it, it's going to move forward in time and allow other people to do similar types of things. Is applicability important? I squeeze that into interesting. Like interesting is another sort of vague catchword. Do humans care? The reason I don't say like valuable is sometimes inventions take a really long time or scientific discoveries take a really long time for their value to be manifest. Like Riemann geometry, geometry of more than three-dimensional surfaces is interesting perhaps. It didn't necessarily seem useful. I would think of it as an innovation, even though it's not necessarily a technology. But then... Decades later, Einstein wanted to find a math that could describe a four-dimensional universe, and he was able to use Riemann geometry to do it. This is, as I understand it, I'm not, I didn't get that far in my physics, actually. But anyway, so it just took a long time. And then now we see, oh, Einstein's theory, we, it's like actually used in some applications. GPS satellites move fast enough and so on that you need to have relativistic effects taken into account. But it took a long time for the applicability of math on more than three dimensions to be recognized, but it was still interesting. So I'm still going to count it as an innovation. Lastly, in terms of the pure theory, how do you separately situate technology and innovation? What's the relationship? Yeah, I think for, in my mind, it's, it's not anything too complicated. Like technologies are born from innovation, basically. New technologies, when they come about, we call that, I colloquially call that process innovation. Other people would focus on innovation is when a technology gets commercialized and diffused and applied, and it's not just sitting on a shelf somewhere in a laboratory. And I think that's certainly an important phenomenon, but I don't know. I just use the more, I think I use the more common, less technical definition when I, in my writing and so on. I like the way you crisply talk about this stuff. Yeah, I think the living literature review stuff, I think one of my goals is to not use jargon because I want to make this stuff accessible to people who are not in the weeds in those fields already. And so I think you have to use common language or like common English and so on because it's the universal language of, of my readers. So before we go further, we'd like to step back a little bit and talk about, I guess one could call it a discipline, 
or domain of progress studies. We'd love to hear your perspective on what is kind of the state of affairs of progress studies and maybe start off by defining or talking about what is actually progress studies. Yeah, I think progress studies is sort of, it's a little bit of a confusing name because it's not like an academic field, really. It's closer to, I think, a community of shared interest that sort of has this ethos of progress and technological and not only technological, but I think the emphasis is often on technological progress. It was born in a Atlantic article written by Tyler Cowen and Patrick Collison, where they coined the term and they said, we need a new study of progress. And I think that article galvanized a bunch of people who were looking for someone to articulate this, this kind of view. And they got to know each other. There was a Slack channel. They started to get to know each other. They held conferences. And anyway, yeah, over time, this kind of group focused around celebrating technological progress and thinking about how we can do it faster and so on came together. And I think there's a couple different strands of how this has become concrete. There's a large group of people who blog and write online with this broad perspective. I would say I'm in that camp. What I do is inherently biased towards being optimistic about technological progress. It doesn't really tend to focus on the potential downsides of technological progress, although we can talk later at some point. I have to think more about that in my newest job. I work at Open Philanthropy now. But anyway, so I was part of that. The Works in Progress magazine was another station of online writing, trying to push this perspective and bring together lots of different academic disciplines and angle them towards what they can concretely tell us about how we should take action in the world to improve things instead of just understand things. Jason Crawford is probably the most famous sort of leader of the movement. He set up the Progress Forum, which is like an online website where people can talk about this stuff. And he heads the Roots of Progress, which is an organization that's promoting this stuff and has just gotten a new CEO and is going to be expanding its activities. And then I think the other is most concrete instantiation of these ideas is the Institute for Progress, the think tank, which was I worked for them as the senior innovation economist a bit last year. They're a think tank that's mission is to accelerate scientific, technological, and industrial progress. They're based in DC and they're focused on high skilled immigration. They're focused on reforming how science is performed in the United States and how it's funded. And then they also work on biosecurity, which is an umbrella term for stuff related to pandemic preparedness, maybe FDA reform, stuff like that. So that's, I think that's the, the movement that started by Collison and Cowan coining this article. It was like a bat signal and a bunch of people congregated around it. And some of them were active and they encouraged each other. And I think you had some of these things happening, but I do think there's a sense in which there's some sense in like, what's next? These groups that I mentioned are all on a great trajectory. I think they're going up. But as for the broader movement, I think there's still some uncertainty about how best to direct that energy and interest towards the most useful end. And I hope that Jason Crawford, he's the best case for this. Like the Roots of Progress, I hope is going to help direct all this energy and enthusiasm about progress and just something else concrete besides just going to work for one of these small numbers of organizations. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you envision your role being in the domain of progress studies going forward? Yeah. So I one time did this presentation to a progress studies conference and my presentation was called putting the studies in progress studies. I view my role as I came from academia, which is not the norm for most of the groups I mentioned. They didn't come from an academic background. And my, one of the things that Cowan and Collison talked about is that even though they said we need a new study of progress or a new discipline focused on progress, it's not that no one studies progress. The issue is that the studies of progress occur in lots of different disciplines that don't really talk to each other a lot. So there's the economics of innovation and science. There's also history. There's sociology and tons of other places like psychology and so on. New Things in the Sun, I think, is one attempt to bring these different disciplines together at a minimum by taking the stuff that's happening in the field I'm most familiar with, the economics of innovation, and presenting it in a very accessible way that is, I think, rigorous enough that you can understand what the economists are doing instead of just hearing their conclusions. I also try to follow social science in other disciplines, but I think it's that's a bit harder 
for me to do. So that's one thing I do is just try to communicate what we're doing in, in my field and also present it with a little bit of an angle of, so what, how do we take this information and do something useful with it? Maybe people who are very applied think that I'm still too far up in the ivory tower, but I think compared to some of the ivory tower people, my focus is more applied. And I think that's one reason why I wanted to work at a think tank that's trying to do reform and why I now work at Open Philanthropy, which is another organization that's trying to take academic studies and actually use that to make decisions in the world. I want to try and, and Open Philanthropy, get more people doing what I'm doing, but for different fields. So have the living literature review model be something that is not just something I do, but it's something lots of people do, but not just about economics of innovation. We'll have somebody doing it for education, for climate change, for whatever field has lots of good academic work that it would be great for somebody to bring together and make accessible to a wider audience. Taking this theme a bit further, what is specifically the state of knowledge with respect to technological innovation? I think it's, it's tricky. What do we know about innovation is always like a little bit fraught because it's like, what do we know about the unknown? Because innovation is always stepping into the unknown and doing something new. And I do think though, that we have a growing body of work about regularities in at least how we as social actors explore the space of the unknown. For example, what kinds of things induce people to make more effort to innovate or explore that unknown? What kinds of things induce them to take bigger chances, not just be incremental and like tiptoe into the unknown, but to take leaps into the unknown. So we have a lot of body about how human beings interact with the new frontier that they haven't yet explored. And then I think we also have at least some information about kind of regularities in that space of the unknown. Like what is the shape of the stuff we haven't yet discovered look like? There's the idea that we can use science as a map to see what it might be like in places we haven't gone yet. So we haven't necessarily done the experiments. We haven't invented the technology, but we can use science to infer what it's going to be like when we get there. I think the fusion stuff is a good example. For decades, we've been, we understand that this technology can work. We understand the principles of it. We can see an example of it in the sun and we can get closer and closer. I also write a lot about these models of innovation based on the notion that innovation is about combining disparate ideas. I think that can sometimes tell us a little bit about the space of the unknown that we haven't yet explored. And then there's this longstanding idea that innovation is this evolutionary process and what's called the adjacent possible is really important. So new innovations you know, protrude into the unknown. And then there's a bunch of new stuff that's next to them that wasn't previously adjacent. And then you can step into those things more easily than before you had made your first step. So this is all very abstract, but it's an abstract question too. So you mentioned the models of innovation. What are the models? The models of innovation. There's probably a bunch, but some that I like, I like the combinatorial model of innovation where there's pre-existing ideas. And innovation is about finding combinations of pre-existing ideas that are useful. You assume the vast majority of them are not useful. So the example always given is chicken ice cream is a combination of two ideas, but it's not something anybody wants. My dissertation actually was on these kinds of models. One of the things my dissertation looked at is it looked at patents that combine pre-existing technologies and showed that in the years after a new combination is made, say between the internal combustion engine and neural networks, just to take two just technologies at random, in the years that follow, you see more technologies that make the same combination, but you see fewer technologies that are exactly the same. So if you imagine combining internal combustion engine, neural networks, and a combine harvester, so I'm in Iowa, which is farm country, this would be like a self-driving tractor kind of thing. You're more likely to see in the years that follow technologies that combine internal combustions and neural networks. So people using that combination in different applications, but you're less likely to see more people making self-driving tractors, which kind of makes sense, right? That's one example of a model of technology. I think the innovation model as evolution is another famous example. Just take biology and assume that innovation follows a similar process. People have done studies of this in computer programming because programming is convenient 
in the sense that it, it has this code that's written in language, and then you can just read the code and you can run text analysis to see how the code changes from year to year. So it's a very nice way to measure how a technology changes over time. Whereas measuring how a car changes over time is a little bit more complicated. And so anyway, these models show sort of evolutionary dynamics. There's this famous paper that's one of my favorites looking at MATLAB contests. So MATLAB used to have these contests where people would try to solve these, write programs to solve these problems that are open-ended problems. They don't have a one right answer. It'd be some algorithm to find the most efficient path through a complex space or the most efficient way to stack a bunch of different objects, whatever. And the thing that was interesting is when you write your code, you submit it, they run it, they test it, they see what its score is on the task. But then the code is up there and anyone can read it who's participating in the contest. And so the contest goes on for two weeks or something. And you can see whose code is the best and you can read their code and you can try to learn from it. And this is the history of innovation in it compressed into two weeks. Cause normally when somebody invents something, it does go out there, it's on the market and people can study it. They can reverse engineer it. They can see how well the market likes it. And they find in this two weeks period, really strong evolutionary dynamics. People take the, whatever the winning code is and they tweak it. That's the most common strategy that people deploy, which is just like evolution the fittest organism is a benchmark and it has mutations. And then the mutations that are better become the new leader. And then we have new mutations off that. So that seems to be the case, at least to some degree, it's not the whole story. Even in these little MATLAB models, there's some things that are not like biology. They have these weird, large combinations where people will take a whole block of code from one program that's very different from another, and they'll combine them. And that's not something evolution does nearly so often. Just take a huge chunk of code from birds and combine it with squirrels to get some kind of flying squirrel thing. Each one has to evolve down the path incrementally bit by bit. But anyway, those are two classic models, I'd say. Yeah, the changing of code and evolving code. I think in internet, yeah. they, call, they call the people who generally do that as script kiddies, I believe. <laughs> script kiddies? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can tell that can't be the whole story also, because we know that I'm when sad. you write code, you don't just tinker with what's there. You plan, you think through where things are going to go. So I think another model of innovation is like thinks of maps, like science is a map of the terrain that you haven't yet entered. When you have science in a domain, you can make very large leaps. You don't have to tinker incrementally, change one or two parts of the code, see how it goes, change another part. No. We can change a whole bunch at once because we're confident. We have general principles underneath that sort of are guiding our action. What have you observed as it relates to how innovation in technology causes change in human behavior? How does technology change people, people's behaviors? You can think of really narrow examples like remote work, which is something that I have written a lot about and thought a lot about. Technology that enables you to collaborate a distance, for example, allows these entirely new social arrangements. You can be like me and live in Iowa, where you grew up and where your family lives, but still work for a DC-based think tank, which is what I did most of 2022, or you can work for a San Francisco-based philanthropic organization, which is what I do now, and I never had to go to either of those places physically. I think more broadly, as an economy becomes richer as technology enables more specialization and we can get more out of our labor and we don't have to just work so hard just to survive. You get huge changes over time in terms of how people live their lives and what they choose to do with their lives and how many people can afford to get educated, can participate in the arts, lots of stuff. Once you just start to have a bit of surplus in society, it opens the floodgates. I love the way you set up your own personal life and not seeming to have lost on opportunity really it's just beautiful the way you're it's really truly really an arbitrage you are like living in satiation of an arbitrage all possible <laughs> all possible through technology and i guess zoom <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm meeting with you guys right now over zoom fabulous i've tried to always be realistic about remote work so i really 
hope it works out. I wouldn't be so naive as to say it's just better on all dimensions, but obviously worse on some dimensions than others, but it has these compensating trade-offs, I hope, like your geographic flexibility, for example. And from a firm's perspective and from an innovation perspective, I like to emphasize that it lets you build a team of people who are draw the best person for the job rather than the best person who's in your local labor market for the job. Mm -hmm. And for some kinds of positions that that matters a lot. I think one of the downsides for remote work is that it's harder to meet people than being in the thick of it. Like you guys in San Francisco, you're going to run into people that I'm not going to run into. Right. So I have to be intentional about that. And one way I do that is I have this newsletter and I use it to go fishing. And I say, if anyone wants to have a virtual chat with me or virtual coffee, please just drop me an email. And I do that a couple of times a week, for example. Yeah. So you got to be a bit more innovative in your approach for sure. So one thing we really like about your work and your sort of living literature review is that of course, if it's living, it's recursive, it's updated, but there's this recursive learning that happens. One thing you seem to spend quite a bit of time on is trying to understand what is known and not known about what works and doesn't work when it comes to technological innovation. We'd love for you to just riff on that. Where are we in terms of our understanding as it relates to what works and doesn't work when it comes to technological innovation? Yeah. I mean, there's, we know a bit about a lot of stuff, I'd say. Very few things are really nailed down. If you think about the pieces of the innovation pipeline, you can think of each of these in turn. I have this article that's trying to synthesize this, and I just updated this a month ago now. So it's fresh on my mind. It was about how to accelerate technological progress, but really it's cutting the innovation pipeline into all these different pieces. You can start with human beings. Who are the actual agents doing the inventing? And now it's human beings. In the future, maybe it'll be AIs and stuff like that. What do we know about that? One theory is if you have more human beings, you should have more innovation because you have more brains working on a problem, more specialization. We have some evidence of that, especially from prehistoric times. It's a tricky question to answer because you can't just say, let's look at New Hampshire versus Texas versus California and see which state is more innovative because all of these people are living, are in a connected innovation ecosystem. They can move, they can talk to each other. It's not really like they're separate. For you to study this problem, you need separated human communities that don't communicate. And that's not really been possible for a long time. Certainly since the internet, you could argue since the discovery of the new world. So there's papers that looked at different islands in Oceania way back when and showed that the islands that have a bigger population have a more complex set of technologies and so on. But we don't know for sure. We don't have that many observations. So that's an example. We have a little bit of evidence, but we don't know that much. And then you turn to what if we could have AI do the inventing for us? We have theories, but it's like really hard to know because it hasn't happened yet. How well could they invent for us? I don't know. Then the next part of the pipeline and in innovation is you have to have even the idea to innovate. So you have a bunch of people, but for a long time, they weren't spending their time innovating. They weren't doing much. And why was that the case? There's a lot of interesting evidence that the notion that you can innovate is not something natural. What is innovation? It's sort of like, I have some problem and I'm going to try to solve that problem in a way that nobody has solved it before. And I think most of the time when you have a problem, that's not what comes to mind. Most of the time when you have a problem, you think, what have I done in the past? What have other people that I know done in the past to resolve this problem? And you just have this set of options and you pick from one. And the idea that I'm actually going to set all those options aside and try something that no one else has done is something that's pretty foreign. And so this economic historian, Anton House, he argues that sort of this idea was one of the most important things that was born in the Industrial Revolution. That's why things really started to change is because this idea that you could do things differently than had been done became very popular. And he has evidence showing that inventors, inventors usually started inventing after they interacted with some other inventors. So there was this social contagion, this inventor was doing it and they demonstrated as a proof of concept, look, here's the thing you can do. You can solve problems new ways. You don't have to just do it the old way. And in the contemporary world, I think we have really good evidence about this from entrepreneurship, really strong evidence that People don't, entrepreneurship is a little bit like this problem where am I going to go work for an organization that already exists or am I going to found a, a totally new organization? And it doesn't seem like people naturally think of just starting a new organization, but being around other people who have, especially people who are like you, 
It's this idea that this is a possibility. So anyway, that's an, a, another area where you've got the people, then you've got to think about how do they decide to innovate in the first place? And then once they decide that they're going to be open to looking for new solutions, what are the things you can do to make that process work better or make them more likely to choose that option? One that we've kind of alluded to already is knowledge. So there's a bunch of work on how well does science affect innovation, knowing how the world works, how does that improve or not improve the rate of innovation? And I think we have pretty good evidence there too, that the rate of science, if we invest more in science, it tends to lead to more R&D. But again, the evidence is not as strong as we might like, not in the sense that there's a lot of evidence showing science is useless, but we just don't have, these are hard problems and we don't have the, the quality of the evidence we have isn't as good as I would like anyway. We have evidence from correlations. You spend a bunch of money on science say in agriculture, and there's papers that show 20 to 50 years later, you get these boosts in agricultural productivity. So it's like a correlation in the data, but it's a really long time lag. So that can be a tricky relationship to pick up statistically. You've also got papers that try to do this with citations. So they look at patents, which are one imperfect, but readily available measure of new inventions. And you say, all right, well, did they cite scientific articles? And if they did, that sort of is an indication that they drew on scientific ideas. And then you've got some small number of natural experiments that are really cool where whatever reason, maybe a geopolitical war or some other geopolitical event like science was stopped or science surged forward. And then you can see what happens to invention related to those fields. And they all point to the same thing. So anyway, this is my third piece in the puzzle. Knowledge helps. Another piece of another big part of the stuff that people study is Suppose you've got knowledge about how to invent. How do you, you got to get it into the head of the person who's trying to solve the problem that the knowledge is related to. So the scientist is studying how something works, but often they're not the inventor. They're not the one inventing something. And we want the inventor who's trying to solve the problem to get that piece of information that helps them solve that problem. And so there's studies on the effects of founding libraries back in the 1900s and comparing towns that get Carnegie libraries to towns that didn't get Carnegie libraries that we think are pretty similar for various reasons and showing that getting a library increased the rate of innovation as measured by patents in that case. There's papers looking at Wikipedia. There's papers that don't look at written knowledge, but look at the knowledge that human beings bring with them. Immigrants from other countries where the country that they're immigrating from has a really strong, innovative industry, a better than average, say, chemical industry. There's this paper looking at Germany. They dismissed all of their sort of uh, Jewish scientists. A lot of them emigrated. Germany was super strong in chemistry. A lot of them migrated to the United States. And they show that this planted seeds for this booming chemistry industry in the United States. And it wasn't just because the chemistry that these German scientists were doing in Germany now is happening in the United States. It's new chemists who are U.S. citizens learned chemistry from the Germans and basically picked up the ball and, and ran from there. And then lastly, there's a big literature on like how cities and office places serve as a place to mix ideas up and learn about knowledge that's relevant. One way to think about it is, was the U.S. versus Soviet Union a good case study in terms of what works and doesn't work when it comes to technological innovation? I mean, I think that my conclusion is that innovation is a social system and there's just a lot of pieces to it and all of them contribute a little bit. People, knowledge, how you circulate knowledge. The thing, the big difference between maybe the US and the USSR is maybe the incentive system we used to incentivize innovation. I think that certainly matters and we have evidence that that matters. But then even stuff like how you organize the team, how you organize your organization and, you know, create a, a culture of open collaboration, or you have these hierarchical teams, or you have them remote or in person, these kinds of questions also matter too. So it's tough to say the thing that matters for innovation is X. I think the, the thing that matters for, there's lots of things that matter for innovation. And I guess the key challenge for a policymaker is to find the ones that are being bottlenecks at the moment and try to tackle those ones. So what that bottleneck will be, will be different in different sort of societies. I guess let's kind of invert it. And so what, what does not work? You know, what, what do we clearly know doesn't work if you want to achieve technological progress? So I think 
Again, it's the same story, the bottlenecks, but I think you can also illustrate this the other way. If you are targeting something that's not the bottleneck, it doesn't work. So for example, if you want a radical new kind of innovation and the science and the underlying knowledge is not really there, it doesn't really matter what else you do. You can create super strong incentives to develop the technology. In my home state of Iowa, we grow a lot of corn to make corn-based ethanol which is this corn-based fuel. And the goal was always to transition from a corn-based ethanol to something called like next generation biofuels, which were going to be grown out of switchgrass. So corn is really inefficient in the sense that we're just using the kernels basically to make this alcohol that turns into this thing we can run our cars on. And there was this plan that we're gonna grow these grasses. They grow super fast. And instead of just wasting all of the plant, except for the kernels, we're gonna be able to take the whole plant, grind it up, make it into fuel. And so the government created this renewable fuel standard policy to try to create demand for the second next generation ethanol. They made these mandates. We're going to have, we're going to buy so many billion gallons a year of this stuff in different years. And they set out this 10 year trajectory. And so if you could develop that kind of technology, you knew there would be a strong, a big market for it. And so it would be profitable to do it. And it just didn't really work. They had to waive this mandate year after year because the technology just wasn't there to meet the billions of dollars in demand. And you see similar things in other industries like medicine. We have really good evidence when you have different new diseases that come to the fore or people have studied, for example, the aging of the U.S. population and how does that affect R&D towards diseases that affect the elderly versus younger you know, these, these things create strong incentives to develop new treatments for diseases that are a bigger market now. And you usually find that it has an effect, but the effect is pretty limited to innovations that are already like quite close to those or like just incremental. They don't spur radical sort of new scientific innovation. So that's, that's one example of a thing that I think doesn't necessarily work is simply creating incentives, even very strong incentives to develop something. If you look at COVID-19 again, we got the mRNA vaccines. They feel like a miracle. There was this enormous demand for a new kind of vaccine that could be ready very fast. And then we got it. But if you read the history of the vaccine, like mRNA vaccine technology, that stuff had been in the works for decades and was actually like pretty close to being ready. It was already being tested for other diseases, this mRNA platform. And the COVID-19 shocks had this technology that was on the cusp, it like burst into the public eye, but there had been decades of this less glamorous science going on behind the scenes. The Manhattan Project is another example. It'd be really great to have this war ending super weapon, but that would have been true at any point in history for a long time. What side wouldn't want some kind of super weapon to end the war? And it happened when it did because there were developments in the sort of fundamental science. So that's one side. But on the other side, if you are in a system that doesn't have a good market, like venture capital or people with the idea that they want to start businesses, then you may find that investing in the fundamental science doesn't really ever seem to translate into the technologies you want. So I think it's not that there's one or two, there's probably some policy that I'm not thinking of that never works. But I think the bigger challenge is you have to identify what is the, what's the state of play and where's the, what's the binding constraint. And if you're not pushing on that binding constraint, you may find that the stuff you're doing doesn't matter that much. I guess, let me give one other example. This is more speculative on my part, but some people think, isn't it surprising that when the internet came along, we didn't see a 10x increase in the rate of innovation? Suddenly we went from knowledge being very hard to access to sort of anyone being able to access any academic paper, read anything on Wikipedia. And we've got the world's knowledge is at your fingertips. And why didn't that just supercharge innovation? And I think it's again, because that wasn't the bottleneck for a lot of people. The people who are inventing or trying to solve problems, they were already, it certainly helped the internet, but they had ways to, they were already very motivated and were using the tools available to them to find the solutions to their problems. They're going to the library, they're talking to people. They were, they're not just passively waiting for knowledge to come to them. And so giving a lot of information to people who were not trying to invent didn't probably make a big difference. It probably helped a bit because there were people on the margin, but that's why I think we didn't get this like explosion of invention. So you mentioned 
the demand for innovation. You also mentioned creating incentives. What are the other key drivers for technology or technological change and progress? Are there some other drivers you think are key? Yeah, so there's creating rewards for inventing. You know, a patent system is one way to create a reward for inventing something. It has its own problems, but it's a way to create a reward. You can also subsidize invention, so make it make the costs of inventing lower. This could be like this is a justification for having an R and D tax subsidy. It's also a justification for having a well funded public education system that trains lots of people, brings them up to the skill level where they could then go on to get PhDs or so on and become scientists. The government has labs where it just conducts some level of scientific research. And then there are these programs like, say, the SBIR program, which give essentially grants to innovative companies. And I've looked at some papers and those programs, for example, work pretty well in the United States. Uh, they work pretty well in Europe. But again, going back to this binding constraint thing, they don't seem to work very well in China. And in China, the evidence is that the programs are not administered there's allegations of corruption and stuff, right? So maybe that's the issue. If you can run these programs well and actually like be objective, they really help firms who get the grants. If you can't, politically connected people get the grant funds and it doesn't seem like it makes a big difference. It certainly helps winning, but it's not like a super great innovation engine. So yeah, this is like the big buckets that I've been focusing on is the incentives. A little, We haven't talked that much about how you organize your inventors. Generating knowledge. So I've written a lot about how the scientific system works and doesn't work and issues that it has and it has, how you circulate that knowledge around. And then I've talked a little bit about like getting that idea of invention into people's heads and sort of making it, making it a career option. That's closest to what the progress studies folk are in some sense doing is trying to just raise the salience of innovation and making it seem like it's something that would be worthwhile to do with your life, I would say. And I think that stuff matters too. How will you measure technological progress? Yeah, it's tough. There are, the easiest way to do it is to focus on a specific industry where there's some metric that you can measure that people agree on. So agriculture, you could look at the yields of crops, for example. If you're doing... If you're studying Moore's law, you can look at how many circuits fit on a, a microchip or something. If you're studying health, you can look at probability of surviving different diseases or just even the years of life, people, how long people live, so on. But all of that stuff is, it can be a little bit misleading too, because it's not ultimately what we care about. Anytime you, fo you could focus on yields, for example, in agriculture and be, well, yields are slowing, the yield growth is slowing. Does that mean technological progress is slowing? Or does it just mean that people are focusing on their efforts on something besides increasing yields? Like in agriculture, GMO technology lets you use less insecticide because now the crops themselves will kill the bugs. And so that may not show up as yields, but it's still a technological innovation that matters. So one way you can get around that is you can go a little bit more complicated. Rather than just tracking one of these numbers over time, you can try to do something multidimensional and look at several different dimensions of something you care about. and create a statistical relationship between them and watch how that relationship changes over time. So this has been done pretty well, I think, in the automobile sector, where they'll be like, what do people care about in their cars? Lots of things, but we could look at torque, we could look at horsepower, we could look at the weight of the car, we could look at fuel efficiency, all these different characteristics. And back in the 1970s, there might have been some trade-off. If you're going to have increasing fuel efficiency, your horsepower is going to go way down. Okay. And you can pick a point on there that you would want. And by the year 2020, maybe there's a much different trade-off. For a given fuel efficiency, you can get way more horsepower than you could in the 1970s. So that's like a two-dimensional version, but you could do this. You can do this with as many dimensions as you want. And look how there's this here that's moving over time. That works for a specific industry. It's a little bit more complicated, but that's, that's one way to try to be a little bit more rigorous. Another way you can do this, you can go even further. Economists have this statistical construct called total factor productivity that's pretty common to measure innovation. It's kind of a measure of, think of technology now as a way to transform some set of inputs into an output. So how do we transform human labor, electricity, capital, 
into cars, for example, steel, all that other stuff. And if we can find ways to transform less, if we can get the same number of cars using less electricity and less human labor, then that indicates there's been some kind of technological advance in the car production technology. Okay. And so total factor productivity is the way that you measure all the inputs, you estimate a sort of mathematical relationship for how many outputs they give you. And then how that relationship changes over time is like a measure of technology. It's in, it's imperfect because lots of things can affect, it can be affected by things besides technology. So if you hire a more educated workforce, maybe, maybe they can produce more cars for the same number of workers, but unless you're measuring education as one of the inputs, you might, that might be a, hard to do. So anyway, you can do it. People try to do it it's a little dissatisfying because it's a little bit of like statistical wizardry and you always have to worry about this stuff. More broadly, stepping back and assessing the technological progress of the human species, to what extent is GDP or GDP per capita an accurate measure of technological progress? And, and what can we do to sort of adjust or amend that to make it more granular or accurate? Yeah. So this is a great example. Like over the very long run, GDP per capita or GDP is really useful. GDP per capita is like taking total factor productivity, but we're going to get closer to the ground and have less, less sort of abstraction, less statistics in there. So like this is wealth per person, right? And the concern with just using GDP per capita is you can increase your wealth per person by, for example, investing in more capital, right? So we give everybody more tractors and they can grow more food, but we didn't actually invent better tractors. We just gave people more tractors and see argument for why you don't care, why you want to not look at GDP per capita. But in the very long run, that argument doesn't really hold because the capacity to, in, to find useful things to give people starts to become more important, right? Going from giving people shovels to giving people tractors is an increase in the amount of capital we allocate per worker. But the fact that we figured out how to invent tractors matters and we found a useful thing to give the people to, to work. Similar GDP is dissatisfying because GDP can increase just because you have more people. And that's why like people prefer GDP per capita. But in the really long run, the number of people that can survive on a given part of land is a function of technology too, right? As agriculture gets more efficient and the, a given part of parcel of land can support more human lives, that's another measure of technology. Just the size of the population, the earth and sustain is the measure of how good we are at, ex at extracting resources from it or not always extracting, we have renewable energy and stuff. So in the shortest run, you wanna look at total factor productivity. And then if you wanna step back and be like, we wanna think also about the invention of totally new things that we would measure total factor, factor productivity of, then I think GDP per capita becomes better. And if you wanna think like millennia wide, you start to think, well, let's just look at GDP, the total wealth that we can generate because in the past, we actually were not able to increase GDP by having more people because we didn't have the technology to keep those people alive. We were too inefficient. The trouble is over the really long run, GDP, you can calculate it, but it's really hard to once goods become, once the basket of goods you can consume becomes so different. If I'm living in 1000 BC versus today, how do I adjust the quality of my cell phone down to something that is like a comparable to the people in 1000 BC is very tricky. And then, yeah, you can look at other indicators like health. How long do people live? We can be more objective about that. And you can take this dashboard approach. There's a really cool study by William Nordhaus, where he looks at how many hours of labor it takes you to produce one lumen of light. So that's something that we can measure for millennia. Like you've got to tend your campfire all the way to have to, how much labor do I have to put in to afford like one lumen of light as coming from an LED and it's infinitesimal almost. How predictable is technological innovation? It's a good question. I wrote a huge piece about this, about path dependency in technology. It wasn't so much about predictability, but more about inevitability. So it may be that we can't predict where it's going to go, but it's always going to go in the same place. And if we reran history, we would always end up in the same place. I think it's quite hard to predict technology out very far. People look at learning curves as a way to predict the future trajectory of technology. These are historical statistical relationships between how much 
how much experience we have producing a good and the cost of producing the good. And they, they often exhibit a tight statistical correlation, but I'm always hesitant to use that to project into the future because there's no underlying reason that that relationship has to be the same over time, right? There's no law of nature that each extra solar panel we produce will give us enough experience to lower the cost of solar panel production by one millionth of a penny or something like that. So anyway, people use these things. They're okay for, they seem to work reasonably well for a really short time period. Over the very long run, when new stuff gets invented, it's just like super hard to predict. And yeah, I wrote this super long piece looking at all the different arguments for how inevitable is technology? Do we really, is there really much plasticity in where we end up. If we rewound the clock, say a hundred years or 500 years and let it run again, would we have similar technologies? Like I'm talking to you on a laptop, would I have something like a laptop or would I have something very different? And sort of my conclusion from all that is the timing and the details of technology probably ch can change a ton. So maybe the laptop would have been invented 20 years earlier. Maybe it'd be invented 40 years later. Maybe it wouldn't even be a laptop. Maybe it wouldn't, ha it wouldn't have a QWERTY keyboard. It might have completely different input, but would we have invent eventually invented something like computers? I suspect so. Would we have discovered electricity and used it to power a lot of stuff? Probably. That's my conclusion about the big major paradigms of technology. They're probably more or less inevitable. I think maybe you can skip one. So maybe if we had pushed steam power a really long way, we would have gotten it Maybe we could have invented fusion at the end of it and skipped the fossil fuel era or the internal combustion era. Maybe, I don't know. It's all pretty speculative. Nonetheless, speculative and incredibly fascinating. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about policy and we've been talking implicitly about institutions, I think, throughout our conversation. One aspect of institutions is just sort of the policy aspect. What do you think is the relationship between policy and technological progress? How much can the nation state impact technological progress? So I think that one bad policy can just totally screw things up. It may be hard for good policy to move you from 1% growth to 4% growth, something like that. But policy is very good at ruining an economy, right? So you want to avoid the bad. And that's not even so much like a technological innovation thing. That's just an economic development question. But on terms of technological progress, I think one thing is the regulatory environment that a country has can matter for how easy it is to deploy technology, start businesses and all that stuff. I think in the long run, the real area where policy starts to matter more and more is on the science side. I think over time, technology becomes more intertwined with science. If you go back a hundred years ago, it's possible to invent a lot of inventions via tinkering and being an individual who's just interested in this stuff. But as time goes on, this burden of knowledge problem that I've written about before, where it takes more and more knowledge to push the frontier starts to loom large and you have to have more specialized knowledge and you have to have, you have to draw more and more on science to figure out how to do things because stuff just gets harder. And there's a lot of reasons why the government tends to play a dominant role in funding and organizing science. It's just very hard. It has tended to be hard to run a super profitable business also off of a heavily scientific research base. And so how you organize science starts to matter more and more. And that's something that we were really focused on at the Institute for Progress was how do we, it's like micro stuff. Like how do we disperse grants? How do we pick how does peer review pick which projects to fund? How do we disseminate results? But I think the bigger question is as government becomes more and more, plays a bigger and bigger role in, in technological innovation in the economy in general, you have to have systems for making government work well, even though it doesn't have, I'm an economist, like the disciplining, the discipline of the market, right? So firms have this like really strong incentive to use themselves well, because they can go out of business if they don't. And government doesn't necessarily have that. So how do you create, how do you avoid sclerosis, the rise of bureaucracy and this kind of stuff that strangles it? I think those are important, increasingly important questions, but also not intractable. There are actually like things you can do to make your government organizations more effective. One thing we're trying to really push at the Institute for Progress was creating this culture of using experiments to evaluate your internal processes, sort of like 
big tech firms use A-B tests to test different ways of doing things. And this is one way to get feedback if you're a large organization that's not necessarily facing imminent demise if from like your competitors, right? You do internal experiments and you learn from that and so on. So that's one example. And on a global basis, which country or geographical nexus do you believe is going to be successful as a technology leader in future and why? It's hard to bet against the United States. We've got, we just have this kind of sinkhole where a lot of the world's talent flows into the United States because that's where all the talent is. It's just a self-amplifying loop. As long as we don't screw that up, I think that's probably going to make us continue to be the R&D laboratory of the world, just because innovation is a team sport. It's increasingly, it's a thing that you have to do with collaborators. There's some evidence that the quality of innovative output on a team depends not on who's the strongest person on the team, but who's the weakest person on the team. And in that environment, that's a really, that promotes really strong assortative matching. There's high returns to matching only with the best types. And so again, that's if the United States is the sinkhole sucking in a lot of talented inventors and scientists, and they want to work on the team with other excellent people, that's where they come. It doesn't have to be though. The UK is, is interesting. They seem to be experimenting with a lot of new sort of scientific I don't know, organizations, they're trying to open themselves up to immigration themselves. And they've just launched this ARIA program, which is an effort to copy or take inspiration from the DARPA models and stuff that the United States has. But anyway, it's just nice to see them trying new and exciting things. And then if you go to this idea that having more people is, is better, then you can start to think, well, you know, India is highly educated and has a lot of people and is reasonably plugged into these innovative communities in the United States. There's some evidence that when people from a country migrate to another country, you know, they form these social connections between them and so on. And so I think that uh, some of that could also be helping. Anything you want to say in terms of U.S. trends or bottlenecks as it relates to technological progress? I guess one way of putting it is, are you optimistic or are you a pessimist or an optimist as it relates to U.S. policy? with respect to technological innovation? Yeah, I'm a cautious optimist. The U.S. in the last year has launched two new innovative federal agencies. ARPA-H is another effort to take inspiration from DARPA and apply it to healthcare. It's been It's going to get launched in the NIH. They've created this, the TIP directorate in the National Science Foundation, which is designed to promote regional innovation. And both of these organizations seem really open to experimental, try different things, improve your internal processes. So that's exciting. And it just also shows that it's a country that is taking innovation seriously and is investing in it. So that's my, my grounds for optimism. We are a country, though, where things can change, right? So I, it's not in the bag or anything, but I'm optimistic, cautiously. It seems like... You're saying the role of policymakers simply just do no harm. That's the number one thing. Yeah, I think that's like, it's much, it's a hard job. It's really easy to screw things up. I think we're, there's a reason the United States is on the technological frontier. And I think our policy environment is reasonably strong. So we don't want to screw that up. But I think that it certainly can be a lot better. And I also think that as government plays a bigger and bigger role in the economy, the quality of governance starts to matter more and more. Briefly, what are you currently working on? I continue to write New Things Under the Sun, my living literature review on the economics of innovation. I started a new job at Open Philanthropy in November. Part of what I'm doing for them is helping them develop a strategy for a potential grant program in science reform, meta-science, they call it, like science and innovation policy. I like working with organizations where academic work has potential real-world applications. We have to actually make decisions based on the studies. The thing that's interesting about open philanthropy is compared to the progress studies group, which is where I, I think I originally came from, they have some elements or some people in open philanthropy are concerned about the potential of scientific progress to cause harm because someday somebody's going to be able to engineer a super virus in the privacy of their own home. Do we really want to bring that day forward as quick as we can? And so it's an interesting thing to think about. Are there things you can do to accelerate science safely, more safely, less safely? And it's just a problem that hasn't given been given a lot of attention, I think, in the economics of innovation. And so I was interested in thinking about it for a few minutes, <laughs> not a few minutes, for a little bit of time. 
And then the last thing I'm doing for them is some opportunistic grant making for stuff that we're not really concerned about that safety stuff. That's like one concern, but there's tons of stuff you can do that doesn't really affect that. One example is what I write, these living literature reviews. I think I want to try and create, help more people, give people financial support to write their own for their own field and stay tuned for that. We don't have the details worked out, but that's one of the things we'll be working on. We'll move on to our last section, which is the outro section. And we try to keep this quick. Okay. Rapid answers. What motivates you? The freedom of inquiry, exploring, learning stuff, subject to the constraint that I need to make enough money to live. And I would like my work to have some impact, all else equal. Beautiful. I love that. All else equal. Which not consensus views do you hold near and dear? It may be... It might be best for society for people to specialize hard in what they're best at, but it's not best for the individual to do that. And so they shouldn't do that. They should have broader interests. Go off the clock at 5.30 and do something different. Lovely. What or who has had the most impact on your thinking, career, or life? It's got to be the economist Tyler Cowen. I was reading his Marginal Revolution blog for a long time and his exploratory life of reading from everywhere, visiting all over the world was inspired, inspiring to me. And then he, his organization, Emergent Ventures, was the first one to give me a grant to work on new things under the sun, like in a professional capacity and not just as a hobby. And I think that really changed the trajectory of my life. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that blog as well. What are you currently reading? Well, as I was saying, you should turn off the clock. I'm rereading Middlemarch by George Eliot. I'm reading Talent, the Tyler Cohen and Daniel Gross book, The Econ Twitter science fiction book club we're reading the dispossessed and then for work i've got to read this book on barriers to bioweapons about people developing super viruses in their garage and what are the barriers to that happening good stuff yeah who are your favorite writers or podcasters so for podcasts all right i like tyler cowan as i've already said he makes a great podcast i like his blog i probably read it every day i don't always agree with everything he says but it's just been very interesting other podcasts i like it's just nothing to do with what I work on. I like the How I Built This podcast. I like the Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast. And then other writers I read. Uh, Caleb Watney, who I used to work with at the Institute for Progress, is really interesting. And whenever he puts something out, I want to read it. It's kind of a standard policy person I read. And then I like Kevin Munger. He's a social scientist who writes about science and innovation, but he has a different perspective than an economist, which I like. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, Visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company, or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.